Good morning. Good morning. It's so good to be here. Thank you so much for having me. You know, when I was a little girl, I was the rule follower. I was the one that was expected to get good grades, to present just so, to be courteous, um, and to, to really just follow the rules all the time. Somewhere about um, high school, I became really good at math. And so without any regard for what it meant to be in finance, I was encouraged to become a finance major because there weren't that many women in the industry and certainly there weren't that many women of color. The pay was good and the upward mobility was promising. So off I went. Next, I was, I was expected to get married, to have children, to buy a house, and really to stay with the image that I have been assigned from childhood. I'm sure it's not an uncommon story. Eventually, I was in a battle between self and society. I was in my head all the time questioning my process, my journey, if I was doing the right thing, if I belonged, what if I hadn't made the right choices for my life. The external expectations that had been placed upon me were wreaking havoc. My mental chatter was out of control. Mental chatter consists of those thoughts that you're thinking about or just pop into your head when you're really trying to think of something or when you're just thinking of nothing at all. They just kind of creep in. Maybe it's just me, but there was a time where I just couldn't quiet my mind. Mental chatter goes something like this. After some time at work in the morning, it might be around 9.30, say, wow, oh my God, it's 9.30. I should have come into work earlier today. I just have so much to do, and there's not going to be any way I could get it all done. I wanted to go to the gym today, especially because I had that muffin instead of those egg whites. And now that's going to completely ruin all of my diet goals. Now I've messed up everything. I'll just start again on Monday. I wish it were lunchtime, but guess what? I don't even deserve to eat anything ever again because of the muffin. <laughs> Can anybody relate to going down the rabbit hole from time to time? Absolutely. <clears throat> Actually, 85% of our mental chatter is negative. Studies show that the things we think about and the way we talk to ourselves is generally negative. How many people in here know what's going to happen in the next five seconds? Anybody? Exactly. But yet and still, we decide to tell ourselves some future bad story. We don't know what's going to happen, but instead of telling ourselves the positive story, we tell ourselves the negative story. Now my hope is that one day we don't tell ourselves a story at all, that we are able to simply live in the present. But for now, it's time that we change the channel to a positive and better story. There are lots of empowering statements like, go for it, go big, go home, it's not that bad, make the best of it, you got this, you can do it. But before you can go and create and jump and think and do and take control of your life, we've got to get control of our thoughts. We have to change the channel. Unfortunately, many times, especially as women, we are defeated before we even begin. We work ourselves up to, into a tizzy thinking, what might happen? What might go wrong? We actually borrow from the future. We borrow worry from the future and bring it to now. And it's expensive because the cost to us is the right now moment. It's our present. My guess is that some of you are taking out a worry loan right now as I speak. Maybe you're worried about the work that was left at your desk while you're at this conference. The event you're missing for your child today because you made the sacrifice to be here. The errands that you have to fit in after work today. Oh my God. And then the fact that you ate that muffin instead of that. <laughs> and how's that going to affect those weight goals? For 30 seconds, I would like you to just get all that worry in your mind. Just go ahead for 30 seconds. Get it all in your mind. And as you're thinking about it, I would like you to literally hold your hands out or think about putting all of that worry in the palm of your hands. Just each thing you worry about, just put it right there. Don't worry, we're not going to throw it away. I know you want it. <laughs> but what I'd like you to do is to just ball it up into a little or big worry ball, depending on how many worries you have. 
And I just want you to put it in your purse or in the seat next to you or under your chair. I promise you, you can have it right back as soon as we're done if you still need it. All right, so what I'd like you to do is if you could just turn the channel back to now and just to be present in the moment because you're worth it. If you think about it, every other part of our body gets a pass, right? Because we rarely pay attention to it. Can you remember the last time you thought about your left pinky finger? <laughs> right? Now, what if you had slammed it in the door right before you came to this event? I bet you'd be thinking about it right now. Well, our brains are never at rest, but we allow every other part of our body just to exist. But somehow we don't turn our minds off. So we're designed to have thoughts, but why do we worry so much? Expectations and often external ones. If we remove external forces, then we might just be able to get closer to planning, executing, and existing without the negative mental chatter. External expectations cause us to lose sight of ourselves and our authentic journey. From the time we're born, external expectations are placed upon us. Think about it. We're expected to use the potty by a certain time, to read by a certain age, to get high grades in school, to have certain careers, to get married, to have children, to be good, whatever that means. And the list goes on. Unfortunately, this happens without any regard for our individual core. <clears throat> Think about a kindergarten graduation. This actually happened at my son's graduation when he was six. He's now 13. Each of the children walked across the stage and the teacher asked the children, you know, what would you like to be when you grow up? So the first child came up and the teacher said, what would you like to be when you grow up, sweetheart? And he said, I'd like to be a teacher. And oh, that's so the parents were so proud. And so then the next child came up and they said, oh, what would you like to be when you grow up, as if they know? And the next child said, I want to be a firefighter. And again, the oh, like, oh, parents were so proud. And then the next child came up and they said, you know, sweetheart, what would you like to be when you grow up? And the child said, I want to be a doctor. And the room erupted with applause. Why? Why did the room suddenly get louder for doctor, but wasn't just as loud for the authenticity of the answers of teacher and firefighter? Somewhere along the way, society decided that doctor was of higher value and to be held in higher regard than teacher or firefighter. So what do you think the firefighter and the teacher will say the next time they are asked what they want to be when they grow up? A doctor. I still have that experience while traveling and talking to people. You know, I've become my mother. <laughs> when I was younger, I would be so embarrassed. My mother talks to everyone. She talks to the postman. She talks to the people in the supermarket line. She and when I was younger, I'm like, Mom, you know, everyone wants to talk to you. So I become her. So I talk to people everywhere. And inevitably, as we're talking, people will ask, you know, what do you do for a living? And I'll say, I'm an entrepreneur and a business owner. And there is a sudden look of, oh. Now they have no idea if I'm a successful entrepreneur. <laughs> but somewhere again, this society has said that entrepreneur and taking risks are good. But good for whom? And when? By all accounts, we are still having the kindergarten experience. Some actions, careers, and titles are held in higher esteem without regard for the person's individual truth. When I was 35, just a few short years ago, I found myself trying to reconcile the wonderful life others said I had with the level of unfulfillment that was in my belly. I was married to a wonderful man vacationing in really cool places. I had a highly visible job. I was the, became the first black female commercial real estate broker for any major real estate firm in Massachusetts. I had two beautiful boys, and by all accounts, I had it all. So what was the problem? The problem was that I was living according to external expectations rather than adhering to my own personal core values. And quite honestly, I didn't even know what they were. Rarely do we have the opportunity to check in to see if what we've been taught to value is actually what we value. Along my journey, I sought personal and professional development from experts at conferences as well as trainings from mentors. 
As much as I took notes and tried to follow their advice and to adhere to the processes they shared, I often found myself back in a rut with the old habits controlling me. Why? Well, because it was their process. It was attempting an external solution to my internal problem. To have sustainable improvement, I needed to figure out my personal core values. Sheer panic and passion led me to invent what I am calling the VIP, or the value identification process, after arriving at an extremely unfulfilled and uncomfortable place in my life, both personally and professionally. The VIP is a trademark system used to assist anyone with determining his or her values and then applying those values for professional success and personal fulfillment. After determining my values, I realized that they were misaligned in almost every area of my life. Wow, I remember that. Professionally, aesthetically, emotionally, spiritually, financially, parentally, and relationally. That's a lot. It was interesting because my hair, and I think Jackie knew me then, my hair used to be long and black. But I've been braying since I was 21. And I remember people, I'd get more wow factor if I straightened my hair. So often I would straighten my hair. And I remember being in the bathroom one day and I was blow drying my hair and I used to have to part it in fours in order to blow dry the curls out and I'd be blow drying this quad and then I'd pin it up and I'd blow dry the second quad and I'd pin it up. And by the time I'd blow dry the fourth one, I had to go back to the first one because I was sweating so much that I couldn't have gotten curly again. And I remember one day being really angry about it and I said, but then why are you spending so much time doing something that you say you like, but that you're angry at the end? And what I realized is that other people enjoyed the results of my process much more than I enjoyed the process of getting there. So I cut it all off and I stopped dying it, and life got even better. <laughs> when I speak of values, thank you. When I speak of values here, I'm speaking of your personal protocol and filter, the filter that you use to make decisions and to process information. For example, things like consideration or options or flexibility or efficiency. The misalignment that I had was creating a lot of negative mental chatter and it was hard to change the channel. <coughs> Mostly, I was beating myself up for being ungrateful when that was not the problem at all and it was time to change the channel. The basis of the VIP begins with thinking of your top three pet peeves. I mean things that really, really tick you off, not just those minor irritations, but the thing that when it happens, your best friend's are like, oh, seriously, now I have to listen to this for the next five hours. <laughs> for example, maybe someone lying to you or interrupting you while you speak or not saying thank you or coworkers that don't communicate. It could be either personal or professional. Now it has become my life's work to assist organizations and individuals in incorporating core values into every aspect of life. From corporate training programs to entrepreneurial ventures and personal journeys, value alignment gives us high levels of authenticity. And it provides a path that you can follow with confidence regardless of your outcomes. How many people know that we really have no control over outcomes? I know, it's a very uncomfortable place, but the reality is we don't. And one of the questions I often ask, and I would like you to ponder at some point later today is, if you never got the outcomes you were seeking, will you still have enjoyed the journey? If you never get the outcomes you're seeking, will you still have enjoyed the, the journey? I want you to enjoy your journey. Okay. All right, what I'd like you to do now is just take a moment to think of those pet peeves. Top three, things that just really evoke a visceral negative response from you. Can I hear a couple of them? Yes. My children throwing clothes that we just bought for them on the floor clothes that she just purchased for her children thrown on the floor. Yes. People who can't merge. People who can't uh, merge. merge. <laughs> people who can't merge. Yeah, people who can't merge. I got a funny feeling that happened this morning. <laughs> a couple more, please. Really negative people. 
negative people. One more. Yes. Thank you, people who don't listen. Now, why might one person have a button of people not listening, but it does not press another person's button in the same manner? Anybody have any ideas? <laughs> That's funny, but no. <laughs> I'm sorry? Childhood it could be childhood experiences. One of the things that I maintain is that on the other side of every pet peeve is a value. So there are times where things that uh, push my buttons, have you ever had a friend come and tell you a story and they are livid? I mean, see things, like you can almost literally see steam. And they're going on and on and on and on and on and on and on about the story. They're exasperated at the end, and you want to join them in this festivity. <laughs> you want to be as angry as your friend. I mean, you love this person. After all, you've shared so much. You want to be there. And they get to the end of the story, and you, and you're, you want them to keep going because you just can't get there. Yeah. <laughs> you don't get it. But they are obviously upset. Well, before I started doing this work, I was one of those people who, if at the mall, um, I, you know, there's sometimes two doors at the department store, so maybe I would leave out of the first door and I'd hold the door for a person and they wouldn't say thank you, so I would just turn around and say, oh, you're welcome. <laughs> because in my mind, you meant to say thank you. Because who doesn't mean to say thank you? Again, this is the old me, this is the not, not the me now. And then maybe the second door, maybe I don't hold it. Maybe I don't. Okay. Now, what if the second door that I dropped and the person that I turned around to say, oh, you're welcome to, was Jackie Glenn? And now it's time to pick a speaker for this phenomenal breakfast. And actually, one of my values is consideration. But at that moment, does Jackie know me as a considerate person? Not at all. She might label me rude, or inconsiderate, or mean. I'm sure lots of other adjectives. The thing is, is I allowed that moment, I, allow, I allowed myself to have a, a emotional reaction and to actually pull me outside of my value system. So I allowed a circumstance to create actually my own value confrontation. I did something that I hate, right? And so this woman told a story, and I, you know, when, you, when you've decided or you've determined what your values are, they either are those or they aren't. And this woman, Alicia Gatson, told the most wonderful story that really just crystallized this for me. And she talked about her grandparents who used to go for uh, an evening stroll after dinner. I think it was in the 40s. And so her grandparents were walking down the street this one particular evening, and the neighborhood floozy was coming up. <laughs> And so as she approached, um, the, the grandfather tipped his hat to her. And so after they got past the grandmother, hands on hips, I can't believe you tipped your hat to that woman. Do you know what she does in the neighborhood? This, 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 and this. And the grandfather, ever so lovely and politely says to his wife, I tip my hat not because of who she is, but because of who I am. Mm -hmm. Now, Having emotional reactions to value confrontations create lots of mental chatter because when we come outside of our value systems, we, be, we immediately begin questioning our actions. And then we start to justify them because we wanted them to have been right, but they're not because they weren't in line with who we are. And since we're trying to reduce mental chatter, the best way to do that is to identify and define your core value system and then live by it no matter what. So now I hold doors, why? Because it's what I do. You can say thank you or you cannot say thank you. It doesn't upset me one bit. Because to me, my core value system makes all the sense in the world. Have you ever heard somebody say, everybody knows that, and you're thinking, no. <laughs> the reason why you feel that way is because it doesn't apply to your filter, it only applies to theirs. Because our value system makes so much sense to us, we expect that everyone should have that same value system. 
when that is absolutely not the case. When we experience value confrontations, it's usually not momentary. Think about the times you experience your pet peeves. It changes your aura and your actions. Sometimes you stop communicating, you become short with people, you have a heated exchange. At times you may step out of your preferred way of being to actually react to the value confrontation. Like I mentioned, one of my values is consideration, but that is not how people would know me if I continue to have emotional reactions every time somebody pushed one of my value buttons. I love this story that I already told about Alicia at this place. So we must live by our core values despite the circumstances so that we don't, so that we don't change the mental chatter channel to ones with thoughts of regret. Sometimes, if the value that has been confronted is not one that is held in high regard in the environment we're in, for instance, humility, maybe humility in a particular organization, not where you work, but in a nonprofit that you're involved in, it then, then that value gets dismissed. And sometimes people will try to downplay it to us and say, oh, it's not a big deal, right? Have you ever been really upset? So, oh, you're making too much of that. But it actually is a big deal because it's a value confrontation for us. Thus, the mental chatter continues because now you're second guessing, well, should I, but I really don't want to be angry about this, but I am angry about this. And so now you're trying to reconcile that and maybe I'm too sensitive, maybe I'm not sensitive enough, and the mental chatter continues. Why me? Why didn't they apologize? Why didn't someone support my idea? Is being bold and braggadocious the only way to thrive here? Might be a question you would ask. When value confrontations continue, it is how good employees sometimes turn bad or motivated ones become unmotivated. It's time to change the channel by identifying, understanding, and aligning our values. So how does this happen? How do we get to a place of having these aligned values in the first place? Well, we are told what to value, a certain job, a certain neighborhood, and how to think of things, what makes a great marriage, what makes a good parent, and we buy into it. But core values and external values are like oil and water. You can try to mix them up, but eventually your core values will rise to the top. Sometimes we quiet our core values in order to live into the external ones so that we can get the labels that we're seeking. However, in many places, of the places that I've worked, it was not fully appreciated, so I fell in line over time, and without understanding, I came to resent my work environment. Many of us compromise our personal values to receive the good societal labels. Labels like go-getter, smart, dependable, knowledgeable, attractive, popular, and the list goes on. <laughs> Why do we even care about labels? Well. Labels create really uh, visceral emotional responses for us, whether negative or positive. When I became the first black commercial real estate broker, the labels came rolling in, go-getter, successful, jet-setter, smart, etc. And the labels feed our emotional bank account. The problem is that the good feeling is just as temporary as the labels when your values are misaligned. This label chasing causes us to live in what I call the LAM, or the land of make-believe. In the land of make-believe, perception matters over truth. And it's easy to live there. It's where Ivy League equals smart, where title equals success, where money equals happy. I'm referring to things like a friend telling you he or she landed a job at a top consulting firm and your reaction immediately is, oh, that's so good. Why would one automatically attach good there? Well, we're using our own value filter, either the external ones that we've been given or the internal ones that we've actually identified to actually only label a fact. It's the same way people label me and my life as great. Facts are just that, facts. They don't need labels. The consequences of label chasing and living value misaligned lives are great. Because the good labels feel good, we begin to chase them without regard for our values. Then when we look up at some point in our lives with mental chatter raging in our minds, and then we wonder, what happened? How'd I get here? 
We get lost because we have not utilized what I call our TPS. You've heard of a GPS, your Geographic Positional System. Well, this is your TPS, and this is your Truth Positioning System. Your Truth Positioning System utilizes your value system as the coordinates to get to your destination so that you are comfortable with how you're getting to the destination that you're seeking. When our values are leading, we become more sure of our decisions. We gain understanding of when we have moments of angst, anger, sadness, and disappointment. We greatly decrease our mental chatter and second guessing. You too can change the channel. We've become a society of label chasers. Again, the interesting thing is that we have no control over how people perceive or label us. Remember that we're filtering information through our personal core values. Your core values and my core values may not be aligned. For instance, some of you may leave here thinking, oh, Monica was informative, confident, and knowledgeable. But someone could ask the other half of the room, and others might say, oh, she was a little boring. I found her arrogant and kind of efficient with her use That's of time. so much, right? <laughs> Since I can't control how you perceive me and the filter that you use to process me, and now that I know the cost of living value misaligned, then I might as well live as me through my core value system, and then I will have no regret and reduce mental chatter. In this space, my mental chatter is just so much less. I am able to change the channel so much faster because I can trust the decisions that I make. It's an unapologetic and more confident way of living. It allows you to put your successes and your failures in the same bucket because you're always comfortable with the core values that you used along the way. You view failure differently. You understand your power to choose in the face of unwanted circumstances. One of the interesting things about failure and I've earned this, excuse me, from an organization called the Efficacy Institute. And it's one of my favorite quotes is that failure is not an indication of your ability to do it. It simply means you need to change your strategy. And when you look at failure that way, and when you use your values to get to the journey, because we have no control over outcomes. Sorry, yeah, again. We have no control over outcomes. We might as well enjoy the journey and make it authentic. Even as you embark on this mass women's conference today that I'm sure will be full of information and tools and formulas, I implore you to think about your personal process as you filter the information. Unchecked mental chatter influenced by external expectations can lead to an unfulfilling existence. You can change the channel. In closing, identify your values. Start by taking a look at your pet peeves and the areas of your life that are most unfulfilling in your aesthetic life, financial, relational, professional, emotional, etc. See, if you can begin to align your values in those areas, you don't have to do it all at the same time unless your values suggest otherwise. It's interesting because when I started to look at, you know, at that age of 35 and I said I looked up and realized that my life was so misaligned. I mean, when I say every area, I really mean every area. I'm surprised that I just wasn't more of a negative Nelly on a daily basis. I think I was holding it all in. But actually, another one of my values is options. And in the work that I was doing, it couldn't have been more routine. In addition to that, the way I was even spending my money, I said I valued options. But the way I was spending my money actually had me bound. And so I had to look at all the areas. Again, I talked about cutting my hair. My hair had me bound. Everything had put me into this area where I wasn't living by my values. Despite what we like to believe, we do not have control over outcomes, but only our process. We cannot predict the future. We can only respond in the moment. Having an understanding of your core values will give you the confidence to, to strategically respond instead of emotionally react. When your mental chatter starts to run away with you, go back to your core values and take comfort in your process. Live a label liberated life. Keep your values in view for your vision. And mute that mental chatter. Change the channel. Thank you. She wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> Do we have time?
time for one question or two? Yeah, we do have time for questions. Um, so um, just stand and say who you are and fire away. Yes. How long did it take me to? To get into your core channel so that you didn't emotionally react. So it was a, a, like a, a peeling an onion. So different areas happened at different times. And it was, um, fortunately or unfortunately, we're in a really good space, my ex-husband and I, but it, the most raging thing at that time, I would say, was between my profession and my relationship, trying to reconcile. But it was probably about a five-year process. Um, had I known more, I probably could have executed it differently, but I was just learning all of this and understanding. And everybody's process is different. So one thing that I don't think you'll ever hear me give is a formula, because we, um, we, we really have to embark on these things authentically and in a way that makes sense to us, despite even what the people that love us around us have to say about it. Thank you. One more question. So core values, I maintain that core values don't actually change. Priorities change, but not values. For instance, I value presentation. Before I had children, I might spend X amount on a pair of shoes because I didn't have to prioritize my children. And then they were born. And then I still value presentation. So it doesn't matter that I now all of a sudden don't care what I look like, but priority-wise, I have to spend differently on shoes, if that makes sense. My mother gave me my report cards from K to 12. It was the best gift she'd ever given me. Because as I started to do this work and I read through my teacher's comments, I realized that I've always been me. I just got lost in the noise and the mental chatter of the expectations of what others had expected me to be. And so your core values really are your personal process. It's how you think of things. And once you identify them and you live, when you make every decision and you filter everything through your core values, you are now no longer worried about what the outcomes are. They can, the labels and the outcomes can fall where they may because of your level of comfort. Thank you for that question. Thank you, guys. We have to get going. But can we give Monica another round of applause? who got a book because you got here early. Um, great for those of you who didn't. Monica, um, how can we get your book? Uh, Amazon? Yeah, you can get it on Amazon. Or you can, if you want a signed copy, just go to monicacost.com. monicacost.com. And someone asked me, Monica was speaking at the conference. Are you? No, I'm no. flying out today. Okay, but follow her on something.